I like the idea of having an anchor. I can't imagine uh, living my life without an anchor for my soul. And uh, sometimes I try to remember, you know, I'm an adult convert, uh, what my life was like uh, before I had the Lord. And I just don't know how I did anything. I don't know how I, uh, how I accomplished anything. I don't know how I decided what to do. I don't know what I based anything. So I really like the idea of having an anchor. And so, brother, thank you for blessing us with those, uh, those words and those songs. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to continue our study through the book of 1 John. We'll be in 1 John chapter 4 today as we talk about lightly healed hearts. And I'm going to apologize up front. It's going to take me just a minute to get to 1 John chapter 4. I promise you that we will get there. I swear that we will. Uh, but it is going to take me just a minute to get uh, to 1 John chapter 4. So I, I'm very careful when I'm uh, studying the Word of God because we all have bias. We all bring bias to the Word of God. We all have preconceived notions. We all have preconceptions that we bring to the Word. And our intent is, first of all, we have to be aware that we are all biased in some way, aware of those biases as we come before the Word of God. And so my intent and our intent ought to be to eliminate as much of that bias as we can. And so you think of some of the study helps that are out there. We can read commentaries. We can read, read books about God. We can listen to uh, preachers. We can listen to preaching and telling us about God, what the Bible says, things of that nature. But the vast majority of our, of our learning, of our study, it ought to come from us alone with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit teaching us what the Word of God is. And only then can we truly eliminate bias that we bring to the Word of God. So, for example, my goal every week is to teach what the Word of God says, but there's some, I'm a fallible man. And so there are some weeks where I think that I know what I want to say ahead of time. And so I will come to the Word of God thinking that the Word of God will support what I want to say. Isn't that funny that I can take the Word of God and use it to support what I want to say? And this was one of those weeks where I, I had something that I, I had in my brain that I thought that I wanted to talk about. And I got into 1 John chapter 4, and the Word of God just wasn't cooperating. <laughs> you know, the Word of God truly is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the division of soul and spirit and bone and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we ought to come before the Word of God to be challenged. We ought to come before the Word of God to be changed. Think about it. The things that we hear affect us. It is impossible not to be affected and influenced by the things that we hear. So I tried to, I used to try to pretend like I wasn't in the military or hadn't been in the military, but I, I'm done with that, so I'll just embrace it. So I use uh, military examples all the time, I apologize. There's a technique when uh, dealing with prisoners of war, and, uh, and again, it works in this context, but sometimes out of this context not. When dealing with prisoners of war, you use what's called white noise, and you flood a prisoner of war's senses, his sense of hearing, with white noise, just different sounds and noises, usually at a higher volume, and you do it consistently, and there's no, there's no melody, there's no harmony, you just, you just make them hear noise consistently over a period of time, and what that does, it's amazing what what that does, that breaks down a person. A person will eventually crack underneath of that. I'm a student of history. If you read about the Vietnam War and some of our veterans we had, uh, prisoners of war in North Vietnam, that was a very effective technique the North Vietnamese used to crack our prisoners. And what that would do is once they cracked under this, this verbal, this sonic assault in their ears, that made it easy for the North Vietnamese to indoctrinate them into different types of propaganda. It broke down their defenses. Just all this noise broke down their defenses. Have you ever been to an orchestra or a symphony? I, I, I am a, uh, I'm a student, or a, not a student, I'm a, uh, a fan of many different types of music, and uh, I like to listen to classical piano when I'm reading the Word of God. Last, last year I was privileged enough to attend a symphony orchestra at Austin Peay, and, uh, and it was amazing. Uh, I think it's the Memphis Philharmonic, not the Memphis with Memphis, the city, Philharmonic, and uh, and it was uh, it was it was awesome. You know, there's 40 or 50, maybe even 60 different musicians 
and they're all playing uh, different instruments at different times and different rhythms, and, and you can see how they're all playing. But I was stunned by the genius of the composition that, that somebody had taken all these different notes and blended them together into like a, this perfect harmony, this perfect melody, and, and I was blown away by that. Now contrast that with, say, a middle school band. <laughs> So if you have children, uh, maybe you've had a kid that played an instrument. I don't know, did Chris play an instrument when he was, I don't know, maybe. Uh, maybe uh, I had a kid that played an instrument when he was little. I, I won't. Uh, decided to be a clarinet player in middle school. And so she picked up the clarinet and was in the band. And so we got to attend the concert of the middle school orchestra. And again, you had 40 or 50 different musicians, maybe not that many in the middle school, maybe 20, 30. And they were all playing on you know, similar sheet music, but it didn't sound quite the same as the symphony orchestra. You know, this guy, this kid over here was out of rhythm, this guy was out of time. Kind of cringeworthy, you know, the, you know, it was a, a caricature of what it is. She's looking really offended back there, I'm sorry. It, it, it was a caricature of the actual composition. Now, can you imagine taking that music, pumping it into some earbuds, turning your volume up to 11 and putting it in your ears and just listening to that? And can you imagine listening to that over a period of time? Can you imagine listening to that for an extended period of time? What that would do to your psyche. Now this is kind of a funny example, but I think this is a perfect illustration of what we are living in today. I still remember when I discovered the 24-hour news cycle. I don't know if any of you remember when you discovered that. Uh, I, I was a Fox News junkie back in the day. Uh, I, mean, I listened to Fox News around the clock. I, I listened to the, the talking heads on Fox News telling me all about what was going on in the world uh, and, and all the different things. Nowadays, most people get their, their news from social media, believe it or not. But all these different people these days are saying all these different things. There are so many voices out there saying so many different things. Everybody has an agenda, and frequently people who do have agendas, they invoke concepts of, of good and evil and right and wrong, and maybe they even invoke God or the name of Jesus to support a particular opinion that they may have. And so they'll tell you things like, it is your duty to vote in this coming election. And you say, well, I don't particularly care for either one of the candidates. They're both a bunch of godless psychopaths. And they say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. It is your duty. If you don't vote for the lesser of the evils, that's in fact a vote for the greater of the evils. And they tell you things like this. Or I have this one particular position, this particular cause that you need to be a part of that will give you purpose, that will give you motivation in your life. It will it will give your life meaning, and if you, it is your duty as a Christian to support this particular cause. There's all these different voices telling us all these different things, and they frequently invoke the name of Jesus, or at least the name of God. And what is the result upon the people? Stress. We live in an extremely stressed out society these days. If you suffer with an anxiety related disorder, you are not alone. Upward of 40% of Americans suffer from an anxiety related disorder. Upward of 40%. That is shocking if you think about it. Prescription drug use is through the roof. Prescription drug abuse is likewise through the roof. And the, and the conclusions we have come to is that there is something wrong. We don't know exactly what it is, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the world, and maybe even there's something wrong with us. And so where do we turn? We turn to all of the popular places. We look to political leaders. We look to other types of leaders, maybe even religious leaders. Maybe you got your favorite pastor that you listen to. Maybe you got your other favorite person that you read their books, or, or, or these days people turn to celebrities and, and look to, to see what they have to say on different issues. And so what I want to talk today is about lightly healed hearts. And we're going to get to what a lightly healed heart is. We're going to talk about that a little bit in just a minute. We've got to hurry up and get to the text. We're going to take a trip through history. We're going to go back to the days of John. Then we're going to go back a little bit further. And we'll come back to John. And then we're going to end up back here in our context today. And hopefully we will be able to figure out what a lightly healed heart is and how that applies to us. So let's look at the book of 1 John chapter 4 as we turn to the Word of God. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, he says, Beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So we got to remember, 1 John is a circular letter. John is writing this letter to uh, different churches in the region of, uh, of Asia Minor. And because of that, it can be instructional for us as well. And, and he's writing an overall letter. It's a letter that challenges us. I hope you've been challenged by 1 John so far. I've been in, in intensely challenged by the lessons we've learned from 1 John. But likewise, it is also a letter of encouragement. It is a letter of encouragement written to believers to exhort them to walk in a certain way, to examine how they walk, and then to encourage them to walk in a certain way. You don't examine yourself how you walk and say, well, I'm failing in this particular area, and then just get down in the dumps about it and depressed. No, you examine yourself, and you say, I'm not walking worthy of the call that God has given me. And so then you decide that you will walk worthy. That's the challenge. And then you walk in the manner which the Word of God tells us. And so John tells us throughout this letter, he says, we've got to walk with assurance. You got to walk with assurance, knowing who you are, or more appropriately, whose you are. Who do you belong to? We got to walk with assurance. And if you don't have assurance, don't be satisfied to walk without assurance. We got to walk with assurance. He tells us we got to walk in purity. I mean, we've talked about that. So we got to walk in the light as He is in the light. We got to reject the darkness. We got to reject the sin in our hearts, the wickedness in our hearts, and walk in the light as He is in the light. John tells us. John tells us we've got to walk in love. He says you've got to walk in love. If you are walking in the light, you will love your brother. He tells us. Likewise, if you say you're walking in the light, but you actually hate your brother, you're actually in the darkness. You cannot walk in the light. You cannot walk in purity. You cannot walk in Christ and have hatred for your brother. Those are mutually exclusive concepts. So John tells us we've got to walk in assurance. We've got to walk in purity. We've got to walk in love. And here in this text, he says we've got to walk in discernment. He says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. What does it mean to test the spirits? Why do we need to test the spirits? What is he actually talking about here? Now, this is actually a term that's used to, uh, to talk about something physical in terms of uh, distinguishing whether it's genuine or not. Taking a metal and somehow doing a test to it to see, is this fool's gold or is this real gold? Is this, is this faux silver or is this real silver? And so he's telling us we've got to do the same thing to the spirits because there's all these spirits out there saying all these different things. This doesn't necessarily uh, have to be you know, a, a, a spiritual being. There's people, there's the, the spirits and the voices that are saying different things all around us. We got to test these things. We've got to discern. We've got to see if they are genuine. If these things are from God. It doesn't matter if they say they are from God. There are many people who say they are from God. There are many things that say they are from God. There are many things that look authoritative. It doesn't matter if this man has a, has a position, if he has a title, if he has a degree, if he's wearing a costume, a robe, or some other form of authority. You need to test the spirit. you got to be a Berean. you got to go home and examine the scriptures daily and see whether these things are true. Don't just take what I said because I happen to be you know, a couple of feet higher than you in elevation standing before you. Go home, test the spirits, and see whether the things that I am telling you are true. Every pastor ought to want his people to go home and examine the words for themselves. And that is what John is telling us that we have to do. We've got to test the spirits. We've got to walk in discernment. Well, that tells us that there are spirits out there telling us different things. Why else would he be exhorting the people to test the spirits? That must be an important thing for them. Let's check out the context of John and maybe compare it to our context today. And then we're going to, like I said, we're going to take a trip a little further back in history and maybe we can learn a few things or two about lightly healed hearts. 
John was writing during a time of intense political turbulence. There was intense division. There was religious division. There was strife. There was affliction. A lot of different things happening in those days. So John was a Jew. He was from around the region of Galilee. He was a fisherman, a common man, and he's called to follow the Lord. And then he followed the Lord for all of his earthly ministry. He was one of the first apostles called to follow Jesus. And can you imagine the things that John saw? I mean, he, he, he walked with Jesus. He lived with Jesus. He was, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there at Passion Week. He was, he was there as Jesus was crucified. He was there at the resurrection. He was there at the ascension. He was there at Pentecost. In Jerusalem, as the church was founded, John was there for all of these things. He saw all this with his eyes, and he wrote them down in the book of John so that you may believe. And what an amazing thing that would be to have seen all of these things. But the, the turmoil that surrounded that region at the time is just fairly amazing. Now, history lesson, uh, maybe take it back to social studies in middle school. This was a period of time called the Pax Romana. That means there was, there was widespread peace, largely due to the domination of the Roman Empire. There, they just had no pure competitors. It started with the defeat of Mark Anthony uh, you know, 30 or so years before the turn of the millennium, uh, before the birth of Christ and, and the, the institution of the, uh, of the emperor. And, and that started the Pax Romana. And it lasted for about 250 years, a time of widespread peace and prosperity externally. But internally, anything but the case was true. Let's take the Jewish people, God's called people. They had always been a rebellious people. The Bible refers to them as a stiff-necked people. And shortly after the death of Christ, it wasn't affiliated with the death of Christ, they began to rebel against the Roman Empire shortly after the death of Christ to the point where they eventually took up arms against the Roman Empire. 66 AD, Titus, who would become emperor, he's a general, he's dispatched to quell the rebellion. And so in 66 AD, he lays siege to the city of Jerusalem. Now, the city of Jerusalem uh, had a population of, they said, just under a million people. But at this point in time, the population was like triple because it was the Passover. And all of the Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And at this time, Titus lays siege to the city of Jerusalem. He builds a wall around the city, and they're going to starve the Jews out. But interestingly enough, the Jews destroyed their own food stockages out of a show of defiance. They destroyed their own food stockages out of sheer defiance. And then the Jews themselves set fire to the temple. The Romans said, well, hey, they're going to burn part of the temple now. We'll burn it too. And so they did. They set fire to the temple. They breached the city gates in 70 AD, and they slaughtered every single man, woman, or child they could find that was Jewish in the city of Rome. Uh, the, the Jewish historian Josephus records up to a million casualties, although most scholars think that's a little bit of exaggeration, a little hyperbole. But either way, there were, there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews that were killed in those days. Josephus said there were so many deaths that, that blood literally flowed down the streets. But did you think that was all? And, and so, so after this, he destroyed the temple. The Jews were spread to the winds. Who along with them? Christians. Because remember, the Romans could not tell the difference between Christians and Jews at this point in time. And this is what scattered the church from Jerusalem. Now, John doesn't say where he was in those days, but John was around somewhere. He very well could have been in Jerusalem as these things were starting. This letter was written in 90 AD, about 60 years after the death of Christ. So, But did you think that was all? That the Jews would surrender at that point in time. No, they didn't. They continued to resist. They fought a second and a third war against Rome. They fought a second and a third war against Rome. So can you imagine if you were a Christian receiving this letter in 90 AD, there's still Jews everywhere, Jewish people everywhere, the types of things that you were hearing as you were living your life and trying to figure out what was true and what was false. What was false. You had Jews still saying, resist. Resist 
politically. Yes, you have spiritual freedom, but what does spiritual freedom mean if you don't have political freedom? So your obligation as a person of God is to take arms up against the Roman Empire, the evil empire, and to fight against them. You had those types of voices, those types of things being said to the people. Additionally, you had Jews coming into the church saying that you have to be circumcised. Yeah, you follow Jesus. That's a good thing. But on top of that, you got to follow the law. You got to be circumcised in order to be righteous. So you had those kinds of spirits saying things. On top of that, you had the Roman Empire. Now, they didn't care so much about Christianity, at least at first. They, they couldn't even tell the difference between Christianity and between Jews. They just wanted peace. They wanted everybody to get along so that they could prosper. And so they didn't care if you worshiped Yahweh, the God, as long as you worship the emperor first. And so the Jews are telling, look, you just come to our temple, you worship, you worship Caesar, and then you can go home and worship your own God, and there will be peace, and we won't bother you at all. And John writes about these antichrists. There are antichrists who left the church. They were part of the church. They left the church and began to teach false things about Jesus. So that was another voice they were potentially hearing. Additionally, early in after the death of Christ, this was when all these early heresies started and people began to teach false things about Jesus. Uh, Docetism or Gnosticism that, hey, everything in the flesh is evil and wicked. We got to just think about the spiritual. There's no way that Jesus could have come in the flesh because the flesh is absolutely wicked. And so we just think about the spiritual. We just pray about the spiritual. We just talk about the spiritual and we neglect the physical altogether. These are just some of the voices that, that Christians in this time were hearing. Can you imagine how confusing that would be? How do I act? Who do I believe? Where do I go? Where do I turn to? Would this induce anxiety in them and stress upon them? I can't imagine how they must have felt. And so what does John tell them? He tells them, walk in assurance, walk in purity, walk in love, and walk in discernment. And here is how you tell if these spirits are of God or if they are not of God. This is how you can tell. Let's examine one more point in history. Let's, let's rewind one, one more time and take a look at one more, uh, one more part of history. And then we'll walk it back and, and see if we can learn something. Let's go all the way back. If you have your copy of God's Word, we'll be in Jeremiah for a few minutes. Chapter 8, I think it will be on the screen. Uh, but we'll be in Jeremiah for a few minutes talking about the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied about, about 600 B.C., so about 650, 680 years before the time when John wrote-ish, almost 700 years. And this was a time during the disintegration of the Jewish state. Now, the Jewish state had been disintegrating for some time. Uh, if you recall, 722 B.C., God raised up the Assyrian Empire as the rod of his judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel. He raised them up as his rod of judgment and he destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and took all those people into exile and ceased to exist and it never existed again. But the Jewish nation, Israel or Judah, that persisted, uh, they did not relent. Now there were a couple of periods of national revival under King Hezekiah and King Josiah, uh, but if, after those two kings died, the people went right back to their uh, their worship of false gods, and, and the, the, they worshiped the god Baal, they worshiped Mola, and really what they did is called syncretism. They blended the worship of the one true God with the worship of these false gods. Scripture even tells us that they sacrificed their children to idols, and so God, in his wrath, began to raise up the kingdom of Babylon in judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He marches against Jerusalem in 605 B.C., and that was the first siege of Jerusalem, and he took exiles, and many think that that is when Daniel and his friends were taken into exile in Babylon. He takes all the precious articles out of the temple that they used for worship and, and took those back to Babylon as well. And then in 597 B.C., he marches on Jerusalem again, 
they install a puppet king called King Zedekiah, who was actually a puppet of the Babylonians, and he's the last king of Judah. And you can imagine, and, and so in 586 B.C. Is the, is the final destruction of Jerusalem. You can imagine being a Jew in Jerusalem at, these point, at this point in time. This is a time of intense political division, a time of intense religious division. You, again, had all these different voices saying all these different things. And these days, you had voices saying, peace. There's going to be peace. Just trust us. And there will be peace. Let's hear what Jeremiah has to say about that in Jeremiah chapter 8. He says in Jeremiah chapter 8, starting in verse 9, and then he's addressing the people who are saying these things. He says, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken, and behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. These wise men who are saying these things to the people, they have rejected the word of the Lord. I want to skip down to verse 11. Jeremiah writes about them, the people saying these things. He says, they have healed the wound of my people lightly. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace. When there is no peace, likely a superficial healing. There's been a superficial healing. Well, what exactly is? We titled this Lightly Healed Hearts. What is a lightly healed heart? This implies, Jeremiah's words, that there is a wound of some kind. Well, what is the wound that is common to all men? Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is deceptively wicked. Who can understand it? This could say, I mean, he says they have lightly healed our wounds, but really our, our wound is our hearts. It's our hearts. The heart is deceptively wicked. Who can understand it? Anytime anybody tells you, just follow your heart, that is probably a spirit of the Antichrist. Why would we follow our hearts when our hearts are deceptively wicked? Who could possibly understand it? Now, the heart is the seat of emotion, it is the seat of our will, it is the seat of our decision making, and it is the source of our total depravity, whereby everything that we touch, think, and do is corrupted in some way. Now, you can do good deeds, you can do, do good things on the outside, you can, you can have outward displays of righteousness, but Jesus calls that, you're a whitewashed tomb. You know, the, out, out on the outside, you look good, you look nice, you look fancy, but you're a dying and rotting corpse on the inside is what Jesus says. And so the only solution to this, the only way to address this is from Ezekiel 36, 26. And he says, I will give you a new heart. I will remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh that you may believe in. And then I will be your God and you will be my people. This is the only way to actual true healing is this way. Anything other than that is a lightly healed heart or a lightly healed wound. From Romans 5, 1, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only way to peace. It's through being given a new heart and believing upon the Lord Jesus. Anybody else that says there can be peace is telling you a lie. Paul calls this peace that, that, that surpasses every thought in the book of Philippians. Again, anything outside of that, anything short of that, anything less than that is superficial, is a lightly healed heart. Let me give you a metaphor. So we got Dr. Rudy, who's a surgeon back there. It would be like Dr. Rudy opening up my knee and seeing that I have a torn AC and then he just stitched it back up and, and just left it alone on the inside. Well, the outside will heal. It, it'll heal up fine and it'll look like a normal knee on the outside, but on the inside, there's something wrong. There's something missing. It'd be like having some kind of wound and just, just stitching up the wound, you know, on the outside, it heals up. You look, you look normal on the outside, but on the inside, you're, you're bleeding to death. It would be almost like having like bone cancer or something like that. And then, and then you go to the tanning bed and, and you put your makeup on it and have your hair done, you know, on the inside, your, your body is wasting away on the inside, but maybe you look normal or good on the outside. This is what a lightly healed part is. 
And there are people who deliberately peddle these lies to us. Now, maybe they do it for a number of different reasons, but there are false teachers. There are antichrists that John tells us about. And even the world who peddle these lies to us, these, these faux healings, as, as if this idea, this concept, this thing can actually change us and help us the way that the Word of God does. Now, I'm sure... That some of these people have okay motives. You know, I, I want to help people. Although there may be, so there's probably some external righteousness there of some kind. But John is clear that there's deception there. There's deliberate diabolical deception to deceive people into thinking that this is real healing. That this is the real thing. That this is a likely healed heart. Let's get back to Jeremiah and see what happens. So, there's a confrontation I hate confrontation, but there's a really good confrontation in Jeremiah 28. There's a prophet named Hananiah, and he is one of these men that Jeremiah spoke about. Listen to what Hananiah says to the people. He says, thus says the Lord. Anytime you hear somebody say, thus saith the Lord, if it's not followed closely by a Bible verse, then that ought to, that ought to, that ought to set off a, a, a beacon in your head that, oh, I need to listen to this because he should be saying the Bible verse. But he says, thus says the Lord. I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I'm going to bring all the people back. Within two years, I'm going to bring the people back. I'm going to bring all the temple articles back. I'm going to bring back the king. And I'm going to restore everything. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. This is what Hananiah says to the people. That's what they wanted to hear. That's exactly what they wanted to hear. Listen to what Jeremiah responds with. He says, Amen. May the Lord do so. He says, yes, amen. Please, God, I hope that that's what's, what is going to happen. I want there to be peace. I want the Lord to break the yoke of the kingdom of Babylon. I don't want God's judgment upon my people. But he goes on to say that the prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times, they prophesied war and famine and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. He goes on to say that you have made this people trust in a lie. He says you've made this people trust in a lie. And that lie is peace. He says there will be no peace. God has raised up Babylon as his judgment against the people for betraying him. So quit telling the people what they want to hear. And then he goes on in Jeremiah 29, the very next chapter, and he writes a letter to the people who are already in exile. And he tells them to pray for Babylon, to be good to Babylon, to work for its welfare. Huh? Why would I work for the welfare of this evil kingdom that has taken me captive? But that's exactly what he tells them to do. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is Jeremiah 29, 11, the most misused Bible verse in all of the Bible. Yes, he had a plan for the people. His plan was to return them after 70 years, but they would all be dead. This was for his children, their children. This was a promise for the people's children. And then he goes on to tell them that the Lord will give them a new heart and he will restore them a new heart. Let's go back to John as we come back to our day here today. Consider all that was going on in the days of John, the things that the people were hearing, all the different voices they were hearing, the different things that people were telling them, invoking even the name of Jesus or the name of God. And what does John say to them? He tells them, he says, walk in assurance, walk in love, walk in purity, walk in discernment. He never directly addresses all of these different voices that are being heard. All of these different things that people are saying. He tells them, do not have a lightly healed heart. you got to look to real healing. There is no healing apart from the healing that we find in the Lord Jesus. Let's come to today and see if we can land this plane today. <clears throat> we live in a nation of people with lightly healed hearts today. We truly do. We live in a nation of people walking around who are mortally wounded on the inside. Mortally wounded. We live in a nation of people who are silently stumbling to the slaughter, is what the book of Proverbs will tell us. And they're turning to all these different places, all these different voices, looking for meaning, looking for purpose. And people are telling them things that they want to hear. They're saying peace. 
peace. There can be no peace. Apart from the Lord Jesus, there is no peace. It doesn't exist. And, and, and we don't feel, you know, the, the people are complicit in this. Romans chapter 1 tells us that they cooperate with the people who are lying to them. And so the people are peddling these lies to the people, telling them there could be peace, there could be healing, there could be meaning apart from Jesus. And the people are believing these lies. The book of 1 John is not for them. The book of 1 John is for believers. So what is our job as believers? This is a great tragedy if you think about it. And, and so what is our job as believers? Our job as believers is one thing. One thing only. And that is to proclaim. To proclaim in every venue, in every form, in every way that we could, in, in every platform that we have to proclaim the healing that can be found in the Lord Jesus. That, that God has to give us a new heart. That's all that we can do. And so we've got to tell people, be reconciled with God. We've got to beg people. We've got to proclaim to them. We've got to beg them to be reconciled with God. God, we got to tell them that, that, that they got to get rid of every single thing else that there is. Burn their Tony Robbins books. Cancel their membership with Oprah. Uh, you know, destroy their Dr. Phil tapes. Do whatever they got to do. I, I wrote in bulletin to, to burn an American flag, to, to cancel their membership in the NRA. Whatever they put their trust in apart from the risen Lord Jesus, they need to get rid of that and turn to him. And only then will they not have a lightly healed heart. That is the only way. For those of you that are believers in the Lord Jesus, there's another tragedy <clears throat> that occurs these days. And that is believers walking around as if they were still slaves to their sin, as if they had life to heal hearts. God has told us that he has given us a new heart. He has replaced our heart of stone with a heart of flesh that we might believe. But many of us walk around as if we are still enslaved to sin. How do I know that? Because I did that. For many years, I did that. For years into my Christian walk, I labored under the, the agony of a certain sin that I've spoken about before. And it wasn't until years into my Christian walk that I believed the word and heard the word from James 5.16. And I confessed my sin to my brother and I was healed. I confessed my sin before, but I hadn't confessed it to the person I had sinned against, and I was healed. And so the Word of God is here to guide us as believers. God does not want us to live as if we have lightly healed hearts. God wants us to walk in assurance, to walk in purity, to walk in love, to walk with discernment. So I'm going to ask Joe to come and sing. We'll do something a little bit different tonight, today, this morning. <clears throat> I was hoping my voice would make it the rest of the way through. So as Joe comes to sing and play, uh, we're just going to we're going to pray, and I'm going to have a time of response. And and my 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 appeal to you is to examine your hearts and your lives. What is it in your heart right now? What voices are you hearing? What do you consume? What things do you hear? Which people do you listen to? Where do you get your information? What are the things and the voices uh, that, 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 that speak into your hearts and your minds? Is it the word of God? Is it, is it the things of God? Are these the things that you hear? Because the number one way we can discern is to turn it off. To turn these things off. Tune out and focus upon the word of God. So I'm going to ask everybody to, to bow your heads and close your eyes. As we prepare for this time of response. Everybody bowing their heads and closing their eyes. And I want you to think with me. Think with me the things that you hear every week. The voices that you hear. Social media. Friends, the internet, wherever. News. Maybe you're still a, uh, engulfed in the 24-hour news cycle like I was many years ago? What are the things that you hear? Are they of God? Are they godly? Do they agree with Peter's great confession in Matthew 16 that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? 
Are they the spirit of the Antichrist? Are they worldly? Are they ungodly? Think about the voices that you hear every day, every week. Where do you turn? Who do you listen to? Are they speaking truth? And then I want you to envision just turning those voices off right now. I'm envisioning even like a, a volume knob or a, a, a power switch. I just flip the switch and I just turn those voices off. I can't even hear those voices anymore. I reject those voices. We reject those voices. These voices that are not of God. These voices that are of the evil one, of the world, of the antichrists. And so we reject those voices. And now I want you to envision in your mind. Opening up the word of God. And I want you to hear I want you to hear the words of John speaking to us as we have turned off all of the voices, we've rejected all of the voices, and I want you to hear the words that John is speaking to us. John says to you, walk in assurance. Walk in assurance. You are a child of the Lord on high. You are a daughter of the King. You're a son of God that can never be taken from you, that can never be broken, that bond, that can never be destroyed, it will never decay or diminish. You are of God. You are sealed unto the Lord on high. You are a signet ring on the very hand of God. John says, walk in assurance. John says, walk in purity. I want you to envision the light as you walk in the light, think of the shadows of, of your sin that you want to walk in at some level. And in your mind, I want to unanimously reject that sin as we walk in the light. John tells us to walk in purity. John tells us to walk in love. I want you to hear the voice. John is telling you, walk in love. Love your brother, John is telling you. Maybe there's somebody you sinned against. Or maybe somebody has sinned against you. And you harbor a spirit of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness plagues you. Now would be the time to set that down and repent and turn from that and to walk in love. Hear John tell you to walk in discernment. Walk in discernment. Distinguish what is from God and what is not God. Maybe you are consuming things that are ungodly. Maybe you are allowing voices to speak into your brain that are not of the Lord. This would be the time to reject those and say, I will turn to God and God alone. Let us pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your word that speaks to us like the two-edged sword. God, we reject, we reject unanimously the voices out there that speak anything other than truth into our hearts. God, we hear your word. We love your word. We embrace your word. And so, God, right now we turn to you. And you alone. I pray that today would be a change in somebody's life. If there's somebody here today that needs life change, maybe there's somebody here today that does not believe in you as Lord and Savior.